Number one, Ibble Dibble here. Hello, friends, and welcome back for the final round of the Narcissist Games. Sign 13, Deeply Repressed Shame. Narcissists don't feel much guilt because they think they are always right, and they don't believe their behaviors really affect anyone else, but they harbor a lot of shame. Shame is the belief that there is something deeply and permanently wrong or bad about who you are. Buried in a deeply repressed part of the narcissist are all the insecurities, fears, and rejected traits that they are constantly on guard to hide from everyone, including themselves. The narcissist is acutely ashamed of all these rejected thoughts and feelings. Keeping their vulnerabilities hidden is essential to the narcissist's pretend self-esteem or false self. Ultimately, however, this makes it impossible for them to be completely real and transparent. The unavoidable example of this is Megan's shame about her family, particularly her father, Thomas Markle. Megan claims that Thomas was actually the one who stopped talking to her, not the other way around. And she implies it's because he sold paparazzi photos of himself to the press in the lead up to her wedding and was too callous, too dumb, or too embarrassed to admit it to her and Harry, and instead called TMZ and gave them the exclusive scoop that he wouldn't be attending her wedding. And we, on that call, I'd said to him, look, if this story, if they can't stop it, then it's gonna come out tomorrow. So why don't we send someone right now to your house to get you out of there now? Because if that's the case, your house will be stormed by media. We'll get you out of there now. It's like, we'll just come and get you a day early. Let's get you out of Mexico. And he said, no, no, I have things I need to do. And it felt really cagey. I was like, it doesn't make sense, it doesn't make sense. And when we hung up, I looked at age, I was like, I don't know why, but I don't believe him. The unraveling happened that week when he wouldn't pick up my call. And instead you're talking to TMZ and I'm finding out that you're not coming to our wedding through a tabloid. She also makes a sufficiently credible argument that either Thomas's phone was hacked or perhaps he sold access to her to one of the tabloids. Like, what's going on? Please just pick up the phone. Like, what's going on? We're not mad. Just please pick up the phone. Like, and the world is watching this drama play out. Even once it was said in the media, I just kept calling. We need to know what's going on. I don't understand what's going on. Are you okay? What hospital are you at? I mean, all of us. We're just trying to understand what was going on. And then someone texted back on his phone. It was really weird. You know how people text, right? Like, you know, my dad used a lot of emojis and a lot of like ellipsis and dot, dot, dot. And, and this was just the opposite. And it called me Megan. I was like, he's never called me Megan in my any day that I've lived on this planet. Meg. And I was like, that's not my dad. So then we knew that his phone had been compromised. And we said, like, pick up the phone. We need to know it's you. Never spoke to him. Thomas Markle claims this is not true, that he spoke with Megan and Harry, told them about his heart attacks, and... They were disappointed, but, but they both said, Megan cried, I'm sure, but she did cry, and they both said, take care of yourself, we're really worried about you, so... Uh, they said the important thing was that I get better. And that's the last he ever heard from them. Who do you believe? I don't believe either of them. But I also don't think selling those photos was that big a deal. Why is it okay for her five anonymous best friends to sell every single childhood photo and anecdote about her to People magazine, but it's not okay for her dad to make a couple bucks pretending to read a picture book about the UK? The selling access to his phone thing, I am far less sympathetic to, if it's true. Do you think it's true? Or do you think Thomas was merely hacked? Or do you think some nurse in the hospital took his phone, recharged it, and sold access to the mail or whatever? The week before our wedding, we get a call from our joint communications secretary. This said, this story is going to come out tomorrow saying that your father has been staging pictures and taking money from the press. And I was like, what kind of pictures? And I remember Jason said, you just need to call him and find out if this is true or not, because it could be really damaging. If anything, I'm sure Jason just wanted to tell him how to be smarter about it. There are news cycles where it can help and news cycles where it cannot.
No one talks about it anymore. But do you remember when William dumped Kate for, I don't know, six months or a year or something? Carol Middleton definitely had a relationship with some pops to take photos of her and Kate shopping, Kate and Pippa clubbing, obviously to ensure that Will saw pictures of beautiful Kate living her best life in the tabloids every Saturday morning. Carol's a good marketer. She kept her daughter top of mind. There's no reason for us to hear about Kate's brother's wedding or Kate's sister's second baby, but we always do. That's a finely crafted effort from the Middletons to maintain their social dominance. The palace knows about this and permits it within reason. If Thomas were savvy and kind, he could have very easily played a similar role in his daughter's life and raised his entire family in the process. Unfortunately, he is a narcissist also, and a big part of where Megan gets her bad behavior from. He had a lot of nasty things to say in his Channel 5 interview that I think support my view entirely. The royals own me. Harry owes me. Megan owes me. What I've been through, I should be rewarded for. Narcissistic parents always believe their children owe them a lifelong debt that can never be repaid. Every paper seemed to want to make me look like a dumb, fat slob. I got approached by a guy named Jeff Rainer, who spoke to me and said, I can change your image, he said. The idea was that these would all be candid shot, discreet, no one would know they were posed or anything. They, it would be just me doing my routine daily. I was feeling that this was very hokey and hammy, but he keeps saying, you gotta trust me. I didn't do it for money. I did this to change my image. It's super strange for an elderly man who clearly doesn't take very good care of himself to be more concerned about his image than the wrath his daughter might have to face. Definitely a narcissistic move. You must still be making money off the use of the pictures. Absolutely, because those pictures will sell forever. Rather a grandiose overstatement. Who's buying those pictures now? I don't care. I mean, at, at this point, they own me. The royals own me. And the way he describes his half-hearted attempts at getting in touch with Megan, I'm not convinced he truly cares as much as he wants to retain some aspect of control. My deal was that I'd talk and do something and wait 30 days to get a response from Meghan Harry. If it, didn't get, if it didn't get a response, I'd try it again. And just some weird egotistical stuff? I hope he has my nose because uh, then every time they see Archie, they're going to see me. Megan knows her dad, and she was not ashamed of him in the sense that normal people are embarrassed by their maybe mothball smelling or weird diet following or overly affectionate or overly strict or religious parents when they're in middle school or whatever. Megan knows Thomas is a dangerous narcissist that would always put his ego before her comfort and might really embarrass her at her wedding with his antisocial, demanding behavior. I actually really sympathize with this. I think Thomas really imbued her with a sense of shame and self-loathing that she has never been able to shake. When she saw the opportunity to cut the head off the snake and have Prince Charles walk her down the aisle instead, I think she exaggerated Thomas's bad communication and health problems greatly because a pity play is less shameful to a narcissist and more understandable to an average person than the narcissist admitting they've been bested by another narcissist. She cut Thomas dead and never looked back. Sign 14. An inability to be truly vulnerable. Because of their inability to understand feelings, their lack of empathy, and constant need for self-protection, narcissists can't truly love or connect emotionally with other people. They cannot look at the world from anyone else's perspective. This makes them emotionally needy. When one relationship is no longer satisfying, they often overlap relationships or start a new one as soon as possible. They desperately want someone to feel their pain, to sympathize with them, and to make everything just as they want it to be. It's a form of codependency, except they have little ability to respond to your pain or fear, or even your day-to-day -day need for care and sympathy. I thought the most amusing example of Megan's inability to be truly vulnerable was the absurd fish parasite story. There was this moment where our private secretary, she'd worked for the Queen for almost, I think, 20 years. And what she said to me was, it's like this fish is like swimming perfectly, powerful, it's on the right current. And then one day this little organism comes in, this foreign 
organism, and the entire thing goes, mm. what is that? What is it doing here? It doesn't look like us. It doesn't move like us. We don't like it. Get it off of us. And she just explained that, you know, they'll soon see that it's stronger, faster, even better with this organism as part of it. It will be hard at the beginning for them to adjust to this new thing, but then it'll be amazing. And I was really hopeful that that was true. She acts as if she put all her faith in palace advisors who misguided and betrayed her. However, if we look more closely at her relationship with the staffer who supposedly made this disgusting and scientifically questionable analogy, we can confidently doubt it ever occurred. The secretary she references is Samantha Cohen, handpicked by the queen to serve Harry and Meghan. Known in the palace as Samantha the Panther, she was considered by her colleagues to be one of the best who's ever done it, a problem solver who had a plan B, C, and D for every possible problem that might arise in a given situation, many of which she had faced having worked for the queen for almost 20 years. Yet she lasted fewer than 18 months with Harry and Meghan. Why? We find out in Valentine Lowe's book, Courtiers, where either Samantha herself or someone who worked closely with her on Team Sussex is a thinly veiled source, that Samantha was the staffer Megan threw tea on in Australia. Samantha was the staffer Megan said, listen, if there was anybody else I could get to do this, I would, too. Samantha had a friendly relationship with Harry and was personally approved by him, but once Megan entered the picture, he allowed Megan to shout at Samantha and sometimes even joined in, and Samantha ended up fielding rude emails from the pair at 5 a.m. in the morning most days. Most damningly, Samantha, or someone on her team, we can't be sure, said, quote, Everyone knew that the institution would be judged by Megan's happiness. The mistake they made was thinking that she wanted to be happy, end quote. So needless to say, Samantha saw right through Megan, saw her agenda, butted heads with her multiple times, perhaps even seeded H&M's paranoia about palace offices briefing against them, <laughs> though out of personal spite, not an order from above. And there's little chance Samantha would have given Megan any but the most superficial assurances, if even those, that Megan's way forward was ever the right way forward. Megan's inability to ever trust Samantha came down to the most minor details, like refusing to wear a hat for a formal engagement with the queen on a windy day, and Megan's need to use some poppycock tale about Samantha to lend credibility to this narrative, years hence, is another example of how she simply can't be vulnerable, even around the memory of a woman she felt threatened by. Samantha no longer works for the Crown in any capacity. Surely, if she wanted to tell the real story about Megan not being a bully to her staff, and if she were a true fan or supporter of H&M, she would have been happy to interview for this documentary. But no, Megan can't be that vulnerable. <laughs> Megan doesn't even want to risk showing Samantha's face. I had to go to the Daily Mail to get these photos of Samantha. In this Netflix documentary, Samantha's face is visible for three and a half seconds as she takes a seat behind Megan and the Queen. Every photo Megan uses of the single appearance she had with the Queen crops out Samantha. <laughs> and people call me a troll. And last but not least, sign 15 an inability to communicate or work as part of a team. Thoughtful, cooperative behaviors require a real understanding of each other's feelings. How will the other person feel? Will this action make both of us happy? How will this affect our relationship? These are questions that narcissists don't have the capacity or the motivation to think about. Don't expect the narcissist to understand your feelings. Give in or give up anything they want for your benefit. It's useless. There are so many examples of H&M's inability to communicate that it was really hard for me to choose one, so please let me know your favorite example in the comments below. In the end, I decided it would be nice to close out this video topic with the most meta example, the elephant in the room, the series itself. This series has an 18% audience score on Rotten Tomatoes, a 1.4 out of 10 rating from 6,824 reviews at this recording. To use one of Megan's favorite phrases, no matter how you slice it, 
This is a communications failure. This is a flop. Why? Because these narcissists had to have it their way. They are so insistent on telling their story with their images and their editing, their personal archive, that they forget or deny that they suck at storytelling. Let me read some of the critics' reviews. <laughs> Henry Mance, The Financial Times. This is the Sussexes' side of the story, their truth, and that seems incompatible with journalism. Ouch. Rachel Cunliffe. New Statesman. Harry and Meghan is an exhausting endurance test. Six hours of your life you won't get back. True. <laughs> Alison Rowett, the Scotland Herald. Six hours is a long time to spend on anyone. Suits or no suits. <laughs> Rude. <laughs> Daniel Diderio, Variety. There's an air of duty about the entire enterprise of Harry and Meghan, as if they're honor-bound to keep reciting their personal story until we eventually lose interest. <sighs> Adam Sweeting, The Arts Desk. Most of it is bland, unquestioned self-promotion. John Anderson, Wall Street Journal. The viewer really has to be on board the royal soap opera bus not to be bored out of one's mind by Harry and Meghan. <laughs> Jesse Thompson, The Independent. Almost unendurable hours of grudge rehashing gives very little further insight into why the pair remain so furious at the royal family. <laughs> True that, Jesse. <laughs> Carol Midgley, The Times. The message always seems to be that Megan is perfect, Harry is perfect, they are always right. Maybe it's all the therapy, but at times they seem drunk on their own righteousness. And Lauren Sarnar, The New York Post. There's not much new in it. It's also hypocritical. There you have it. Flop, flop. The public hates it and the critics hate it because they made it without thinking of us. They made it without thinking of anyone but themselves. They're so bad at communicating because they don't see why they should ever even consider putting themselves in another person's shoes. Those dirty plebeian shoes? Oh, they might not even be John Lobbs. I don't even know what to say anymore. These two need to hire a babysitter, go to improv class in LA, and learn how to behave like humans. <laughs> See you in the new year! Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.